Hey friends, it is July 1st. Can you believe it? We are now halfway through 2023 and glad to be with you today as we worship together. My name is Tim Wright. I am the pastor here at Community of Grace Lutheran Church. So glad that you're joining us this morning. Uh, I want you to use your imaginations and I want you to imagine that you are out in a big field and there's uh, the beginning of a forest right behind you and maybe off to the side is a stream and it's dark out. And you're sitting in front of a big bonfire with the rest of your village or your tribe. You're sitting in semicircles around that bonfire. And between you and the bonfire is the storyteller. He's got his back to the fire. He's facing you. And without saying anything, he draws your attention to the night sky. And the first thing you notice is that bright, almost full moon. And then you see the stars for as far as the eye can see. And then he cups his ear to give you the sense that you should be listening to nature for a few moments. And you hear frogs croaking and crickets cricketing. And you hear the leaves rustling in the wind. And then the storyteller speaks and he says all of this. The stars, the moon, the sun, the sky, the birds, the animals, the trees, the river, even you, all of this was created by God. And the God behind all of this is a good God. This God brings order and harmony and peace and life to chaos, even in your life. This God provides lavishly for you. This God knows you. This God cares about you. And what this God creates is good. It's very good. And before your grandma can search you, you yell out, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, why is everything so messy? Why is life so painful? Why is this good not so very good? A few, few of the villagers nod in agreement. Even your grandma leans over and she said, good question. And the storyteller turns to you and he says, I've got a one-word answer for you. Sin. And so you ask the obvious question, what is sin? Now the storyteller could answer this way. Sin is characterized by three aspects. Disobedience or breaking of the law violation of relationships with other people and rebellion against God, which is the core concept. The word sin derives from the Old English sin, S-Y-N, for, for the original sunjo. Now, it may be related to that of the Latin sons or suntus, which means guilty. In the Old English, there are examples of the original general sense, offense or offense, wrongdoing, misdeed. The definitions of sin are varied and can range from something as minor as an insufficiency to something as grave as the total wickedness or collective guilt of all humans. Now, he could answer that way until the whole tribe falls asleep, or he could tell a story. Once upon a time, this good God who created all of this created a huge garden, a lavish garden, filled with fruit trees as far as the eye could see. And he created it for two people. And so you yell out, well, what are their names? And the story teller says, Adam and Eve. And God said to Adam and Eve, you have free reign of this entire garden. It's my gift to you. It's my lavish provision for you. But there's one tree that belongs to me. That fruit's not for you, it's for me. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. But every other tree in this garden, you can eat from that. Well, one day, a snake approaches Eve, and you shiver a bit because like Indiana Jones, you hate snakes. But this snake can talk. And it says to Eve, did you know that the fruit from that tree of the knowledge of good and bad can make you wiser? Now, as Eve looks at that fruit, it does look pretty good. It's bright. It's shiny. And if it can make her wiser, if it can make her more like God, then surely God would be all for her eating it. And so she pulls a piece of fruit down, takes a big bite. She hands it over to Adam. He takes a big bite. And their eyes were open. 
But they found that they weren't wiser. They weren't more godlike. They were human. And their eyes were open to their vulnerabilities as human beings. And they were embarrassed and they were ashamed. And so they quickly tried to cover up their humanity with some scratchy, itchy fig leaves. And then they hid from God. Now they learned a hard lesson that day. When we listen to the voices that try to lure us away from God's best for us, or when we try to become wise on our own apart from God's wisdom, or when we think we can grab hold of the wisdom of God and use it for our own selfish purposes, we end up like those sheep who gnaw their way and who uh, munch their way into lostness. We lose our way. We wander away from God. And our wisdom, our own knowledge isn't enough. And we end up unleashing chaos into the world and brokenness and pain. And not only are we alienated from God, we find ourselves alienated from one another. We take what God meant for good and we disfigure it. And that's why God's good world isn't always so good. Not because of anything God has done, but because we tend to depend on our own wisdom rather than God's wisdom and we get ourselves into trouble. We break things. But the story doesn't end there. There's a surprising twist because God came looking for Adam and Eve, not out of anger, and he found them. And he clothed them. He put nice warm clothes on them, removing those itchy, scratchy leaves. He clothed them. Now, yes, there were consequences to their actions, not punishments. There were consequences. But what God was saying to them by clothing them was that he still loved them. He still cared for them, and that he would always find them, and that his love for them would always have the final word in their lives. Now, thousands of years later, after the telling of that story, Jesus told that same story, but recast it. Once upon a time, there was a father who had two sons. This father was wealthy. And he took great care of his sons. He loved them. He lavished provision on them. But for the younger son, that wasn't enough. He thought he knew better than his dad. And he wanted to go off on his own. So he took what really didn't belong to him. It's his father's money. But he took what didn't really belong to him. And he headed out off on his own. But in the process, he lost his way. He lost all of his money. And then, because he was broke, this once rich kid was now feeding pigs. He'd lost his money. He'd lost himself. So he decided that he was going to go home, not to apologize, but to try to trick his dad into letting him back into the family. So even though he's heading home, he's still lost. But then a surprising twist takes place. Before he can enter into the village, his father sees him, and his father runs to him, not out of anger, but out of love. He throws his arms around this lost son. He puts a robe over those tattered clothes that he's wearing. He puts shoes onto his callous, torn feet. He puts a ring of sonship onto his finger. And then he throws a party. And he declares to everybody in the village... This son of mine that you see here, he was dead, but I raised him back to life again. He was lost, but I found him. You see, the story of Adam and Eve is not a story of some historic event that happened thousands of years ago. It's not really a moment of the big fall. The story of Adam and Eve is the story of our human condition and the story of how God responds to it. The story of Adam and Eve tells us that sin is not behavior that needs to be punished, a punishment that's vented onto Jesus. Sin is lostness. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned to our own ways. Sin is being lost. And God's response is to go to the death to find us. Sin is a relational word. It's about a broken relationship between God and us and us and others. And God will die in order to put that relationship back together. 
The story of Adam and Eve is not the story of our behavior. It's the story of our lostness and God's response as he runs to us in love to find us. And that's what the cross of Jesus is all about. It's about God running to us, finding us where we are, dead in our sin, in our lostness. He finds us. He speaks life to us. He raises us from the dead. And so Jesus runs to you today to let you know that no matter where you are, he'll always find you. And he throws that robe of love onto your shoulders. He puts those shoes of forgiveness onto your feet. He puts the ring of sonship or daughterhood onto your finger. And he says, you are mine. No matter what, you are mine. And I will always find you. Amen.